just the the evidence for designing living things, particularly in the information we find in the first self-replicating molecule. Um, uh, so let's talk about the origin of life. Um, again, where where were we, say, I don't know, 100 years ago? And what have we found out that for you suggests that it looks like we're living in a universe that, that it speaks about some kind of agency behind it rather than this sort of naturalistic? Yeah, uh, absolutely. This is my favorite subject. But could I make one more point about our previous two? Please do. Go ahead. <laughs> I just about the rhetoric because this so ties into your your theme in, in your book about the surprising rediscovery of or belief in God. And that is that even the attempts to circumvent these theistic arguments based on the beginning in the first place or based on the fine tuning end up uh, requiring auxiliary hypotheses or, or alternative hypotheses that themselves end up having tacit theistic implications. Quantum cosmology has a tacit implication that you got the universe coming out of a highly constrained mathematical uh, conceptual apparatus. It's, it, it implies the need for a mind. The multiverse implies it, it takes you right back to the fine tuning again. So you're right back to the need for a mind to explain things. Even the attempts to get around the theistic arguments have themselves pushed the theistic conclusion to uh, back into the conversation. So I think that's a very interesting thing about the dialectic that is causing this shift to take place sociologically that you so, you so beautifully documented in your book. Um, now to biology. Um, yeah, the, she, let's origin of life and the the my my PhD. So I did my PhD on origin of life biology, and my PhD. Um, one of the examiners, Harmka Kaminga, who had written a very definitive history of origin of life research, that noted that the origin of life and the nature of life are two very closely related questions. Because if we're trying to, if we want to explain the origin of life, we have to define well, what is it that we're trying to explain the origin of. And since the 1950s and 60s and 70s and right up to the present, every new turn has revealed a deeper and deeper and deeper layers of complexity in the living cell. So if we start in the 1950s, we get the, um, you wanted to go back 100 years, but we'll just go back 70, okay, to the famous Miller-Urey experiment. Um, they set up a spark discharge chamber, zap some uh, chemicals with uh, electricity, and they produce some amino acids in their in their vet. Two of, two or three of the protein forming amino acids, touted as a huge breakthrough. We're on the cusp of understanding how life arose from simple chemical uh, constituents on a prebiotic earth. That's the idea of chemical evolutionary theory: life from simple chemi chemistry. Ironically, in the same year, Watson and Crick elucidate the structure of the DNA molecule. Five years later, in 1957, 1958, Crick, Crick puts forward something called the sequence hypothesis. And because he realizes that on the interior of the DNA molecule, that famed double helix, you have these chemical subunits called bases or nucleotide bases. And he realizes that they're functioning as alphabetic characters in a written language or like the digital characters in a section of machine code. He realizes, and very early on, people realize the DNA is, contains a kind of digital bit string, and that that information is being used to construct the proteins and the protein machines in living cells. And it takes about seven years for Crick's sequence hypothesis to be confirmed by work that's going on in molecular biology on both sides of the Atlantic. It's a fantastic story in the history of science. But by the mid-60s, it's beginning to to dawn on on biologists in particular, but but others as well, that we do indeed have an information storage and transmission and processing system inside the cell, and that you can't really build anything in life without the information in the DNA. At least later, we discovered there's other layers of information stored in life. There's the epi or ontogenetic layers of information. But even setting that aside, just taking us to the mid-60s in molecular biology, we now have something that's been revealed that completely destroys the idea, the 19th century idea of the cell as a simple homogenous globule of plasm, as Huxley put it. And so that now starts to put origin of life research under extreme pressure because the origin of life researchers now have to explain the nature of life as we find it, the, the actual complexity of the cell, which is an informational complexity. It's, a, it's an integrated complexity. And 
And so uh, what, I've, what I've done in my first book, Signature in the Cell, is then trace that, that challenge and look at the different approaches that were taken from the 1950s and 60s on to try to explain the origin of the information you need to build the first living cell. It's very much like in our computer world where if you want to give your computer a new uh, algorithm, if you want to give it a new function, you want to give it a new app, you want to give it a new operating system, you've got to provide code. And the same thing is true in life. If you want to build a cell in the first place, you've got to have the information to build the proteins that service all the important cellular functions. So where does that information come from? That that question became kind of came front came to the front, uh, the forefront of studies in origin of life research by about the mid 1960s, late 1960s, and then there have been a series of attempts to solve that. Some based on chance, but that didn't last very long because the the, the amount of information. Uh, I think by almost by acclamation among origin of life researchers was so much greater than could be explained by random as, uh, assembly or interactions of molecules that that went by the wayside. Then people tried to explain it by reference to self-organizational processes. There are problems with that. The basic laws of nature do not generate informational sequences as in digital code. They generate uh, repetitive patterns of order like the repeating patterns of NaCl, NaCl, NaCl in a crystal, not something like a line of poetry, like time and tide wait for no man. In, the information in life is not simple repetitive order. So uh, self-organization has had big problems. Then they tried to combine chance with natural selection, but there's a problem there. You don't really get natural selection as an operative process until you get a self-replicating organism. Further, people said, well, maybe you could get self-replicating molecules like RNA, but it turns out to get RNA even to copy a little bit of itself, and that's all we've been able to do in the lab, get about 10% of it can be copied. But even then, the investigator has to sequence the, the nucleotide basis, the genetic letters on the RNA molecule to get it to achieve even that limited form of self-replication. So where's the information coming from that makes that possible? It's coming from an intelligence. So what are you simulating in the lab? You're simulating intelligent design. And that, I think, underscores the key argument here that we're making, and that is that, that whenever we see information, especially in a digital or an alphabetic form, as we do in DNA and RNA, and we trace information back to its source, whenever we have a known source of information, it always arises from a mind, not a material process, whether we're talking about computer code or uh, hieroglyphic inscription or uh, uh, Cyrillic text or English text or something in a book or the information we're transmitting over the internet or over radio signal, information always ultimately results from a mind. One of the early information scientists, Henry Quassler, said that it, uh, the creation of new information habitually uh, results from conscious activity. So, my argument has been that when you the, the discovery of information at the foundation of life is providing a powerful indicator of the activity of designing intelligence in the origin of life. And the absence of an alternative, uh, a credible alternative materialistic explanation is not the sole reason for the inference to design, but it reinforces it. Because what it shows is that the inference to design, we know of a cause that can produce information. The naturalistic models for the origin of life have not explain where information could come from. Therefore, the inference to design is not an argument from ignorance, but an inference to the best explanation. It's the only inference that's consistent with our knowledge uh, of cause and effect, which is the basis, again, of all scientific reasoning.